yourself on mute. Right. All right. Or mute yourself, right? So um, in this world, you get all kinds of people. Uh, and, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're taking a class online. This whole Zoom thing has opened up a lot of avenues for a lot of people. So I was in a class recently. I mean, it's a very, very serious, serious study class. And there's this uh, person in the class and they were using, they didn't know they were off mute. They were using colorful language, as you might say, thinking they were on the phone to somebody and not, the language was quite colorful. And uh, I never saw them back at the class after that uh, again. But anyway, you have to be careful. People, um, you know, you say things off mute because you're talking to someone, you don't realize what, what gets out there. Anyway, um, we were talking about uh, last time about patients who, um, you know, are in a life-threatening situation. Somebody who, um, you know, I don't know, let's just make a case. Uh, a person falls down, it looks like they're having a heart attack, you don't know what the situation is, they're on the road. They're not Jewish. It's not Shabbat. Uh, sorry, sorry, it, it is Shabbat. Um, and, and you're thinking to myself, can I violate Shabbat? to worry about saving a non-Jew? Who cares about them? They live over there. We live over here. They don't want anything to do with us over there. We don't want anything to do with them. Let's stay to ourselves in our little uh, community and let the non-Jews look after the non-Jews. He can lie there until a non-Jew comes along and gets him. I'm on my way to shul for Shalosh That's more important. I got Herring and Zmiros to sing. And what do I care about him? That was the approach, um, believe it or not, by our post scheme at one time. Early on, we believed that a non-Jew would never even expect you. They wouldn't expect you to, to, to come to the rescue for them. Why should you? Not only we knew that they wouldn't expect us to, but, uh, you know, they keep to themselves, we keep to ourselves, I don't have to worry about them. We know, again, today that that's not the case. Uh, we're brought up in a society where we don't care if someone is Jewish or not Jewish, or if they're Muslim, or if they're Christian, or if they're um, Buddhist, or, or Jainism. We do everything we can because we, we believe that it's because of Pekuach Nefesh, saving a life is important, but Pekuach Nefesh is not the reason. Because Pekuach Nefesh itself could, you could say, only relies, only, only, only applies if you're dealing with a Jewish person, saving the life of a Jew. Every Jew is important. The early poskim, the early authorities didn't have that as a reason. We learned that the reason that they said that we have to try and save a non-Jewish life <laughs> is to prevent discord. We don't want them to hate us. They're going to go around. They're going to say, you know, the ambulance, the Hatzalah in Israel drove right by because the person wasn't Jewish and left them on the road and went to save a Jew. Didn't even stop. Now that has happened. That has happened in uh, New York City and from neighborhoods. It has happened in Israel. It's shameful. It should never happen. And according to our post scheme that we learned last week, when we finally, after all these weeks, came to a decision, the decision was, we have to do everything we can to save the life of a non-Jew. If it's on Shabbat, we violate Shabbat. We Shabbat vanishes. We use that word. Uh, I didn't use it, but that's what the post game said. Uh, and we go ahead and we work on doing everything we possibly can without worrying about a Shinui. That's what's interesting. So what is a Shinui? A Shinui is something that is not the normal way of doing things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, so we don't have to do things in a different manner. Like, you know, if you had to cook something on Shabbat because you were ill, you might say, I'll, I'll turn the stove on with my left hand. It shows I'm trying to be a little bit different on Shabbat. If I have to write a prescription and I'm a doctor, maybe I'll use my left hand to write the prescription. It's called a Shinui to do something different. Where do we learn the word Shinui in our daily practice is from burial. When we use the back of the shovel first to show it's a different sign of shoveling, that is a shinui that we're all accustomed to. But a miral and nachri, to tell a non-Jew to do something, that's a whole different topic. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. 
So what did we learn at the final analysis, as uh, JFK used to say in his sermon, in his speeches, in the final analysis, in the final analysis, we learned that you do everything and you violate Shabbat. You do not have to do things differently to save the life of a non-Jew on Shabbat. And why is the reason? We would like to think and we would like to believe that the reason is because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing. It's, it's, it's what a menschlichkeit person would do. But that's not our reason. Our reason is we do it because we don't want more hatred. We don't want them hating us more than they already do, in a sense. You know what I mean? Why should we uh, uh, cause more discord? Let's try and get along and we'll do everything. <laughs> well, that, that opens up a different can of worms because then the doctors in the hospitals, you get a from from doctor at the Shari Tzedek Hospital in Israel. And he says, well, do I need to use a Shinui? Do I need to do it differently? I don't want to do it. And then the post game said, no, just do it Kedarko, the regular way. What does that mean, the regular way? It means that as long as your kavana, kavana, we think of kavana in prayer. You hear that word, did you daven with kavana? Did you daven with kavana, as they'll say in, in Ashkenazis? Did you daven with kavana? Kavana means intent. The intention was when you're davening is to really daven and whether you're asking for something, it could be for peace in Israel, it could be for health for your loved one, it could be that you are just thanking God for everything God gave us. And in the Shemona Esrei, for instance, when you're engulfed in tefillah and you're saying the prayers, there's a big difference between davening and um, thinking about the, uh, I don't know, the chocolate caramel corn you're going to have after lunch, right Esther? We wish, we wish. I know, the chocolate covered caramel corn. That would be delicious. Or, you know, the bowl of ice. We, we could be thinking about the stock market. We could be thinking about whether or not the Raps are going to win the game. You know, you never know what's going to happen in life. I went to bed 1130 last night. I was watching the tennis match with Ali Asim, the Montrealer, the tennis player. He was three games down behind. And I said, he's blown. He's never going to get this. I went to bed. I woke up this morning and he won the next three games and took the set. He took, he took the, he won that whole uh, thing. And I, I was very surprised. Life can change and turn on a dime. And that's why the post game said, you know, uh, they weren't they weren't playing tennis, but what they did understand was that uh, in the game of life, if you want to call it that, you have to focus on saving the person's life in that moment and not worrying about the halachas of Shabbos or Yontif. And you don't have to do things differently with the Shinui. They're saying up till now. And they're saying that your kavana should be not on breaking Shabbat. Your kavana should be only on saving the person. Even if it means that you're a Jewish doctor and the only reason you're trying to save this person of a different faith is because you don't want to lose your medical license. You were given a medical license. You swore an oath that you would save people and do the best you can to practice good medicine. So now all of a sudden you're sitting there going, I don't know, the person's not Jewish. Why do I have to bother? No, your intent is to save the person. But let's say now your intent changes. It's human nature. There's a brand new piece of medical equipment and you can hardly wait to get your hands on it to use it because you haven't had an opportunity to use it yet. This is your chance. Your covenant is not supposed to be on, wow, now I get to use this new piece of medical equipment. This is, I'm so excited. It's like getting into a new car. How could you not be excited to drive a brand new car for the first time? Which actually, you know, when I think about it, it's not that exciting anymore. It used to be exciting back in the 60s and 70s. My parents would get a car, like they'd save up their three thirty five hundred dollars and buy their Dodge Valiant. I remember this. And we would drive around the block and everybody could see the new car. We would take the neighbors for a ride and everybody would come over to your house. They'd all look at it. They'd all look in the back seat. Do you have a radio? Do you not have a radio? That was such a big thing. Today, um, your neighbor gets a car. You don't even look twice. Big deal. You got a car. Who cares? Nothing's exciting anymore. A new purchase, a new television. But in medical industry, let's say you got a brand new stethoscope and now you're going to use it for the first time. That can't be your kavana on Shabbat. Your kavana has to be that everything that you're doing is for the sake of the patient, okay? Enough said. Why are we saving the life of a non-Jew? Because we don't want discord. All right, what about a patient who is not in a life-threatening situation on Shabbat? 
we have rabbinic prohibitions. It's not everything is Midoraisa, not everything is Torah. The which rabbinic prohibitions can we set aside for a non-life-threatening situation? It's a very controversial subject. We talked a little about Rav Ula and Rav Hamanuna, who said that if there's no danger to the patient and if there's no thought that the patient's going to die, then uh, Omer Lenachri Vase, ask the non-Jew to do it. That's where the term um, Omer Lenachri or Omer Lenachri in proper Sfardit um, is telling the non-Jew to do something, instructing them to do something. Go and cook my mother sick. She needs a meal. It's Shabbat. Why don't I do it myself? Well, you will do it yourself if there's not a non-Jew doing it. You'd rather it be a rabbinic prohibition. So in other words, if you tell a non-Jew to do something on Shabbat, and we thought you can't do that, right? But then we brought up the idea last week of the, again, when I use this term, please, I, nobody take um, offense to it. Uh, they, they use the word Shabbos Goy. Goy meaning anybody that isn't Jewish. Well, when you ask a Shabbos Goy and you say to the Goy, you go and do something. You're not allowed to tell the goy, do me a favor, go to the drugstore and buy me those marshmallows that I like. You know what I mean? I love those chocolate coconut marshmallows for Pesach. Go and get me the coconut marshmallow. Noreen doesn't like them so much, I know. But I, so, so go and get me the mar. You can't do that. But if it's something that is somebody sick, Omer Lenachri, you can tell the non-Jew, not ask the non-Jew, you can instruct them. You can even say, go ahead and do it. How about Shabbos, uh, your furnace? There's no heat. You're freezing. It's below zero. How can you enjoy your Shabbat to enhance your Shabbat experience? In the old days, they had non-Jews that would come in and they'd shovel coal for you into your uh, stove. They called them the Shabbos going. They would turn on the lights for you. They would light the lamp. They would Today, we don't have to light the lamp. You know, I'm going to bring this up also because we talked about this in technology. We'll go back to it one day, but <laughs> things are changing in halacha. And it's becoming challenging for the modern post game to keep up to date, uh, not just with cooking, but with issues of lighting. Because, you know, we always thought of uh, you turning on a light, you had to do it with a shinui, you know, use an elbow if you had to do it or whatever it is, because it was dark in the room. That all applied to the issue of cooking on Shabbat, creating something new. You were creating something new. Um, it, it wasn't the issue of a spark, like some people thought. It was the, arch, the issue of creating something new, bone building. Uh, when you turned on a light, it was related to the issue of bishul, which is cooking. Fascinating. Because when you turn on a light bulb, it had a filament inside, and it heated up, and the filament got hot. You know, uh, think back to those little, was it Mattel? What was it? Betty Crocker stoves had a light bulb in it. You could actually bake a cake in there with the light bulb. You could bake a cake. Well, today... When you go and you buy a light bulb at uh, Home Depot, go and try and find an incandescent light bulb. They're getting harder and harder to find. They almost don't exist. So you're buying a light bulb that doesn't have a filament in it. And um, that bulb is not bishul. Do you know you can put your hand on that light bulb and hold it there all day long and it doesn't even get hot? You know, you know what it's like when you have to wait, take a paper towel, put it on your hand, turn the light bulb to get it out because it just burnt out and you want a new one, you'd, your hot hand would get hot. So I used to take a paper towel and I'd wrap it around and slowly, gingerly, and then you'd hold the bulb and put it down and it was hot. And then you put a new one in, screwed in, you got a light. Today, the light is burning all day long. You put your hand on the bulb, you cup it like this, and it never gets hot. So it's not bishul, it's not cooking. You can take that light bulb and put it into the Betty Crocker stove. Hey, what are Betty Crocker stoves going to do if there's no more incandescent light bulbs? What's going to happen to those stoves? You know, you 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 put in that uh, light today. You're not you're not cooking any cakes with it. So, is do you need a shinui to turn on that light? This is a challenge for modern poskim. Well, if it's not cooking, if it's not heating up, if it's not really creating something new, if there's just why can't I just flip the light on? The light's doing nothing. I'm not, you know, who it's, it, it creates a, I don't care. It's got, why? Well, then the issue is becomes bone building. Well, how does turning on a light become building? It becomes building because you are making the circuit complete, which goes down to the transformer on the street. And the transformer is connected to the main power supply at the main, wherever it is down by the dam. And the dam is connected to the main 
power plant down wherever Toronto Hydro has its power plant? Well, um, that's called building something. You're building a circuit that is completed from the main power plant. So that could become the issue. How does that apply to what we're talking about today? We have a patient who is not in a life-threatening situation at all. Um, you could have a non-Jew um, doing everything for that patient. How does that work? Asks the Rambam. And Rambam says, you tell the non-Jew to do a task and he does it. She does it. No hinting, no beating around the bush. Just do it. Boil the water, switch on the light. Similarly, Rambam says it's correct to ask this person to apply the antiseptic on the eye if it's needed. Why can't you apply the antiseptic? We learned that last week. Who remembers? It's not life-threatening. You still have another eye. I never thought of that. That's a very good, Adele, very good. I, 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 that's, a, that's, uh, that's the old post. But remember then they, later on they said, no, we still have to do it to treat the one eye too. But that's what the earlier post game would have said. That's a very good answer. I, I didn't think of that. But uh, no, the, so the answer that I was looking for was um, that uh, uh, spreading ointment on an eye, are you ready for this? Is called memoreach. Memoreach is one of the 39 Shabbat violations. And I, I said, we're going to go through this one day. We're going to do a class on just there's 39 things you cannot do on Shabbat. 39 violations. They're called the, uh, the, uh, the Shabbos Malachas, right? So what are the 39 things? I can't name them all off by hand, but one of them is smoothing and spreading. And why do, does smoothing and spreading count? And how far do the Puskim take it? The modern Puskim? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Well, well, it goes all the way back, the smoothing to the hides. When they take animal hides and they had to smooth the hair off the hides, so you'd have smooth leather. Do you want to wear a hairy leather coat? No. They take the hair off the hide. They smooth the hide. Smoothing is not allowed on Shabbat. It's one of the 39 malachas. Well, how far do you take this? Do you remember the toothpaste? Before we had these plastic tubes and they were made of like a metal and you would squeeze it and the metal would hold its shape. Everybody forgot about those because we haven't seen them in years. They were made of what, tin or I don't know, I don't, probably back in the old days, they were made of lead and we were probably ingesting lead and we didn't even know it. They gave us everything. In my kindergarten class, they gave us asbestos to play with. And we made menorahs for Hanukkah of asbestos. And that explains a lot about why my brain works the way it does. And then they gave us things like, here's a ball of, uh, of uh, mercury that came out of a thermometer. Go and play with that. You know what I mean? We poisoned ourselves. That's what they did. Somebody can adjust it. Anyway, um, memoreach, spreading and smoothing, was taken this far by modern Puskim. In fact, by Rav Moshe Feinstein, who was asked this question. And it's off topic, but it's very, you know, Ava, I go off topic all the time. I can't help it. But this is interesting. How far do you take this, this memoreach issue? Well, the old toothpaste, they said, you can't brush your teeth with toothpaste unless you squeeze the toothpaste out before Shabbat onto the brush. Can't do that in the morning on Shabbos because you're shaping something. You're creating a mold. You're making the, the, the metal container into something different. Then the poskim said, no, you don't have to worry about that because that's not your intent. Your kavana is not to make a shape to create something new out of the toothpaste. You're not going to take it and hang it up from your chandelier and go, what a beautiful tube of toothpaste. You're not creating something. So they said, oh, well, we've got to come up with a different reason why you can't do it. Can't squeeze it because you're squeezing the toothpaste out of the tube and that's memoreach. You're creating a tube coming out, flowing out. You're shaping the toothpaste into a cylindrical tube as it comes out of the toothpaste. You can't do that. That's memoreach. That's mamish memoreach. No, we'll let that go too because that's not your intent. You don't care about the way it comes out. It could come out as a blob for all you care. And because your intent is not to do that, do you understand how far intent goes? Havana. Intention is a big thing in halakha. Thank goodness. Why do I say thank goodness? 
Because hachzara, like uh, when you want to return a pot to the heat on Shabbat, to the, the plata, we call it a plata. It's a, like a warming board, a warming tray, if you have one. So, you know, you, you take a pot, you take it off, and it's still warm, and you serve your cholent, and now you want to put it back on to keep it warm, because maybe at 2 o'clock you want another serving of this stew or cholent. Well, it becomes an issue if you take it off and your intent was not to return it. See, what if you weren't holding the pot? Your grandchild says, um, can you get me uh, a lollipop? So now you put the pot down on the counter because you go and get a lollipop. You give the kid the lollipop and now you go, oh boy, I did something wrong. I put the pot on the counter. I'm supposed to keep it in my hand. No, because your intent when you first took it off of the plata was to return it to the plata. So because your intent, they let you off the hook. That's how far serious... Uh, these are all rabbinic violations. Uh, rabbinic violations can go. Do all of us worry about this? No, I wouldn't lose sleep about it. But if you were someone who really wanted to observe Shabbat, you need to be concerned about it. So when you're asking the non-Jew or yourself, there's a difference between spreading the ointment on the eye from Memoreach you have to do it to yourself. You need ointment on your eye. What do the post say you're supposed to do? Dab it on. If you just dab it, dabbing is not, it doesn't say anything in the 39 malachas, you're not allowed to dab. So I, smart ass I am, I asked my teacher, I said, does that mean bingo's allowed? You're only dabbing the, the what is it called? The bonker, the, you know, the dabbers, they used to have the bingo. My mother loved bingo. So once in a blue moon, we'd go to the international center and it was a big thing. She'd play three cards or four cards, I don't know. And you have bingo cards and they had these dab bobber things, these ink things, right? So it made me think of that. Does that mean the dabbing, you can play bingo, then you're only dabbing, you're not spreading. I'm sure not because why can't you dab a bonker on Shabbat? <clears throat> By dabbing, by dabbing, you're pushing out the fluid. You're actually pushing. You're causing the movement. I never thought of that. It's a very good answer. I never thought of that. E excellent. Aren't That's you, not the reason I'm looking for, but it's a great answer, Ava. Aren't you creating something new by putting a color on the card? You're fifty. You're you. You're right. You are, I didn't think of that either, the creating something new part. I didn't think of that. You could say, oh, there's a piece of artwork. I put five dots on it. You could. You're crazy. I never thought of that. But, Ava, you were, you got the answer right with one of the words in the sentence. Brenda, what was the word that she gave that was the right word? What did she say again? <laughs> say it again, Ava. Um, you are creating something new by putting color on the card. Creating. Color. Color, but but I want to say you shouldn't be playing bingo in the first place. <laughs> Correct, but I'm saying I'm looking for a leniency. I'm thinking maybe if they say the dabbing is okay, uh, uh, John has the answer. Uh, you're printing. You're. It's like uh, writing. You know, you're you're putting ink to paper. Yeah, but that's not my intention. My intention is just to get the six in a row and win. I just want to win the the, the stuffed animal. Good answer. <laughs> you're right. I'm just trying to go. I'm trying to be. Um, Contra, what am I when you when you don't agree with someone? Contrary, I'm trying to be contrary. The answer is color. Sovea, dying is one of the 39 malachas. You know, we have all these. You're not allowed to dye the wool or the thread. Everything was relating to what they did in those days of the Talmud. We didn't have bingo in the Talmudic times in the 1300. Rambam, um, uh, Rambam was not playing bingo, but Rambam's people around him that he was treating might have been farmers who had to dye wool or linens sovea sovea sva from the word sva color is not allowed on shabbat dyeing smoothing gathering harvesting so gathering sorting can't sort the field you can't sort the grains, you're not allowed to sort the grains. So how does one put away cutlery into a drawer that you've taken off the drain board on Shabbat? You want to put it away. You want to put your forks in the fork section 
and you want to put your knives in the knife section, and you want to put your little spoons in the little spoon section, and the big spoons in the big spoon section. Well, you're not supposed to do that on Shabbat. You're supposed to wait till Shabbat is over and do it after Shabbat, because that's sorting. Did you know that? Shabbos morning, you wake up, and you look in your drawer, and you go, I have no black socks. I want to wear black socks today. It's Shabbat. All your black socks are in the dryer. You left them in the dryer. They're dry, but they're in the dryer. So you want to fish a pair of black socks out of the dryer. The problem is you've got underwear and undershirts and shirts and sweaters and not sweaters because they'll shrink and socks. And I don't know if whatever it is that you have in there, t-shirts, everything's in the dryer. How can you separate a pair of socks one black sock and find the other black sock when there's white and brown and green and yellow and orange in there. You'd have to sort. You'd have to pull two. Yeah, go ahead, Ava. If I only black, you're going to say. No, no. I have another question. If you open the door to the dryer, typically the light, the light comes, on. comes on. Right. So it's the refrigerator issue with the light bulb. But when you opened the dryer door, was your kavana? To, to turn the light on or was your covenant to get the clothing to get the clothing so the so intent that, is different so no so then it becomes yeah. seek so you you've learned a lot you've learned a lot because you brought up an issue that we brought up at the very beginning are you ready for this you're you're going to remember when i tell you about it seek resha delo nicha seek resha what's a pasuk a sentence right esther esther knows that because she knows what a soft pasuk is so a seek resha is an inevitable ending, an inevitable something that happens at the end. What was the inevitable? The inevitable was you opened the dryer because you wanted to get out a pair of socks and the inevitable happened, the light went on, but your intent was not to turn the light on. Your intent was to get the socks out. This is all part of the thinking of the reasoning of how we determine halakha. That's why it's important. So now you go and you say, oh, I opened up the dryer. Now the light went on. That wasn't your intent. It's not a midaraisa then, it's a midarabanan. At worst, it's a rabbinic breaking of a rule. It wasn't your intention. You got the clothing, it's all in a big ball. You got a problem. You need a pair of black socks. You can't sort the clothing and say, here's the underwear pile over here and here's the shirt. You got to get a pair of socks out of here. You throw the clothing in the air and they land all over the living room floor. And now you can see where the two socks are and you can pull the socks and take the socks out and have a pair of socks for Shabbos. I kid you not. That's how far halacha could go. I'm not saying you're going to do that. I'm saying that's how far it's supposed to go. Pasik resha delo nicha, the inevitable, is taken from the Talmud when the child says to the father on Shabbat, Daddy, there's nothing to play with. I want a toy. And he says, okay, I'll make you a toy. And he takes a chicken, grabs a chicken, and he cuts off the head of the chicken and hands the chicken head to the kid. And says, go play with the chicken head. Yeah. You know what the inevitable thing that happened was? He killed a chicken. He didn't want to kill a chicken. His intention was not to kill a chicken. His intention was to make a toy for his kid. Pasik Reisha, Delonicha, was an unintended thing that happened as a result of his what he did on Shabbat. He shechted an animal on Shabbat. You're not allowed to. One of the 39 malachas, it's a violation. He shechted an animal on Shabbat. Okay, Noreen. Okay, so going back to the socks, then you should only buy one color socks. <laughs> like instead of buying a, an assortment and then you got to sort them and match them. If they were all black, you wouldn't have that problem. But you know what? Then you've got sports black socks for going to the gym and you've got dress black socks for going to shul. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to get it ready the night before so you won't have that problem? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you, you didn't but you didn't get it ready the night before. So remember at the very beginning in technology, we discussed this. We're gonna go back to this one day, but we discussed this. Can I ask a question that's been course, burning me for years? When the kids are real orthodox and they go out and play ball, I don't I don't agree with that. Why are they allowed to play? You know, they're busy on the street playing ball and it's Shabbat. I don't think that's right if you're Orthodox. What, and what they do it all the time. What is the violation? Well, they're exerting themselves. They're, um, they're throwing a ball. 
you're allowed to exert yourself. Uh, you can run to shul. You're supposed to run to shul and walk home slowly from shul. You're not allowed to shower on Shabbat. That's a big problem. Why? Memoreach, you're taking soap and you're smoothing it and you're whatever it is people do. But, you know, and your hot water issues and all of these different things and turning on the hot water. So there's all kinds of issues related to showering on Shabbat. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a kid running around and playing ball. So they're running around and playing ball. They might fall and hurt themselves and cause someone to have to take them to the hospital. But you know what? They can walk across the street and trip and fall and hurt themselves. So there really isn't the halachic issue because there isn't an inevitable action that's going to happen because of their hitting ball. There's different issues. For instance, they're not supposed to maybe hit a ball with a bat. Well, that's what I mean. Um, there's all kinds of things. But listen, in the Sephardic modern community, especially, the kids use uh, skateboards. They use bicycles. They use um, all kinds of different things and uh, balls and basketball. They play in all these different things. So the parents look at it this way. We don't want our kids mingling with non-Jewish kids on the street. Here they are, Jewish kids that are observing Shabbat, playing with other kids that are also like-minded observing Shabbat. If we don't let them play some ball, then they have to sit all day and study and learn on Shabbat. They're not going to do that. They're nine years old. They're 29 years old. And they want to play and they want to do fun things. So that is their way of, um, if you want to say, relaxing on Shabbat. I know a lot of people in the from community, they've done a little bit of studying. They went to a shiur after their davening and they come home and in the basement of their house, they have a TV and the TV is on. They want to watch a little news. They want to watch a little uh, sports. You know, it's not really sinful because they are um, doing something, Bittelsman uh, Torah, they're doing something when they could be doing something more important on Shabbat. But watching TV in itself, if the TV was left on, is not a Torah violation on Shabbat. So you have to look at it. Is it a, a Midoraisa? Is it a Torah violation? Is it a rabbinic violation? How serious of a violation? And is it better to let them do this than to do other things that are much more importantly worse. Yes, Brenda. There was something that's interesting. You talked about leaving the TV on before Shabbat so you can watch TV. Well, years ago, Norm had, we had cousins who, who lived, who had a cottage and they were baseball nuts. And if we would go to visit them, we'd go on Shabbat. They didn't mind us driving up there. We'd spend the day with them, but they had the TV on on Saturday afternoon to watch the ball game. Many of my from friends, I can tell you right now, have their and, TV. On and so. we thought that was very strange. And we read that, and they they tried to explain to us that we turn on the TV before Shabbat, and then after Shabbat, it's on, so we don't have to worry. But I thought that was so interesting. Right. <laughs> It's true. Anyway, there's a lot of things that are done. Um, you know, it was very popular in the 1970s and even 80s, I'll say 80s, to um, from people would leave their radio on because they wanted to hear Saturday at the Met. And um, it was very important to them to hear the live, the Metropolitan Opera. They wanted to hear the opera. And they would miss it. And we didn't have recording devices to record that back then. So the only way you'd hear it is by hearing it. These are the days when going to shul was, you didn't go to the shul to hear a rabbi give a drasha. The rabbis gave a drasha twice a year. Shabbos HaGadol between Pesach there and maybe Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It was twice a year they gave a speech. A long one, but it was like twice a year. The rest of the year, they give classes during the week. They didn't give Shabbos drashas. You davened and you went home. If you were in a fancy city, then you went to hear the chazan. And the chazan would daven, and maybe he had a choir, and maybe he had soloists, and maybe he put on a whole big show. It was like going to the opera. These cantors were opera singers. They were Richard Tucker, Jan Pierce, uh, Malamud. Um, I could go on, Moshe Stern, Mordechai Hirschman, Moshe Kusevitsky. Th these were cantors that were great opera singers in their own right. So going there, they didn't want you, you didn't care if you sang along. It wasn't participatory. They weren't singing melodies like we do today, Kachenu and Sim Shalom. Maybe the choir, if they had one, would sing it. And you could sing along a little bit. But that was not the intent. The intent was you go to shul, it was a show. 
but it was an appreciated show back then because that's what people wanted. That was their way of participating. It was like going to the opera, you know, and you could sit for four hours in shul and you could listen to that. Today, people aren't as interested in that. They want to, even a Heche Kedush on Shabbos twice as people are complaining is too long. I keep hearing from uh, people, uh, what happened? We went back to nine o'clock. We, we, we were before 9.30 to 11.30. It was even better. And I said, well, then if you don't like coming at nine, come at 9.30. It's 9.30 to 11.30. You know, you can come at 10. And it's only 10 to 11.30. You can come at 25 after 11. You got a five-minute service in Kiddush. Esther watches at home, so she's davening at home, but she comes at the end for to, to have a cup of coffee. There's nothing wrong with that. The idea is, is that you can do whatever it is that you want. I think shul should be, it could be five hours long if you really want it to be. It doesn't mean you have to come at 8.30 if we start at 8.30. Come whenever you want and be there for as long as you want. Everybody thinks because we started and it's a three-hour service, you have to be there for three hours. So that's a whole different topic, but shul was more of a performance in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. And then it became very much more participatory. That's a different subject. It's off topic. To go back to Brenda's point, having a TV on Shabbat is not what we're supposed to do. You can make all the excuses you want and say, I do it because I want to see the CNN because there's a war going on in um, the Ukraine and I want to watch the news. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I only watch it when Wimbledon's on the Australian Open, the US Open, the World Series, the NBA championships, and the college football. Otherwise, I don't watch it. You know what I mean? Like, there's always going to be something for you to watch to have it on. So people do when they make their decisions, they're going to do it, they're not going to do it. You do your best to, to not uh, uh, violate Shabbat. But in those 39 prohibitions, and that's why I take you to, we went through all uh, several of these things. You can't do dying. You, can't, you have to think of what the action is. What do they do in a hospital when they have uh, a piece of equipment and the person is not even particularly really sick? For all we know, they're a hypochondriac. For all I know, they're making it up. We can't think that way. We have to think that everything that this person believes is real could be real because what if it really does happen? They complain they're having a heart attack every Saturday afternoon. They're having a heart attack. We take them to the hospital. Guess what? They're not having a heart attack. They got gas because they ate too much Cholent, I don't know. So the thing is, is it, it, it's always the same thing. But all of a sudden they complain, no chamo, this Shabbat, that they're having a heart attack and you don't do anything about it. And they were having a real heart attack. Then what? So you can't take anybody uh, and how they're feeling. So this is why Rambam is telling us that we're allowed to do all of the things on Shabbat when they aren't even one of the 39 malachas, we already know that we can do them. The reason that he tells us this is because we have implied a prohibition that we're not allowed to do these things unless the patient has reached the level of some kind of a minor disease or discomfort. In order for these leniencies to click into place, we need a patient who has some failure of function or discomfort. For example, it's possible to have two different kinds of a headache. Remember we talked about that? One person could say they got a little bit of a headache. It'll probably pass in an hour or two. Another person says, I got a headache. I got dizziness. It's throbbing me. Um, I, I, you know, I, one could have a lower level. One could have an upset stomach accompanying the headache. Um, one can affect functioning. One cannot affect functioning. How does a headache affect functioning? And the post scheme say, if it's hard for you to read, you want to study Gemara on Shabbat, Talmud, you want to look at the, 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 you want to daven, you want to say mincha, you open up the Siddur and your eyes are swimming and you can't even read the words. That's how bad your headache is. That is considered a, um, a discomfort that is causing to um, a lower level or a disability in terms of your functioning. So it's not just you can't walk. Because before earlier, Poskim said, if the person can't walk around the marketplace, that's called not functioning. Then you can take him to the hospital or to the healer, they said. But if he can walk around the marketplace, well, I'm walking around the marketplace, but I'm almost blind from this headache. That could be your discomfort. That's also a lack of functioning properly. 
So therefore they said you can use a mortar and pestle, you could grind medicines, you can grind your herbs. Uh, when you're grinding one of the 39 prohibited labors on Shabbat, you aren't allowed to do it uh, if you're going to make wheat into flour, they said. So if you're grinding because you want to take a grain or a wheat and you're grinding it up so you can bake bread after Shabbos, that you're not allowed to do. But if you're grinding a pill up because you have to give it to a child so they're able to swallow Tylenol, you know, there was a lack of Tylenol for children in the... Um, not just the province, but almost all of Canada. People were going to the United States to get children's Tylenol. And I was thinking, my son-in-law, if you heard me say this, he'd probably get mad. He's a doctor, you know? He's a... And they needed... He said to me, oh, I was in the States. Can you bring me back children's Tylenol? We don't have any for, the, for my grandchildren. I said, why don't you do what my... Like, why do you have to have children's Tylenol? We didn't have that when I was a kid. Why can't you take a half a Tylenol grind it up, smear it on a piece of toast with some jam like my mother did and eat the toast and jam and you got the you got the acetaminophen. That's what your parents did if they had to give you Tylenol. They weren't going to Shoppers Drug Mart to buy liquid Tylenol. So everybody was making a big, big stimulus, a big tumult out of the shortage. And I was thinking there's regular Tylenol on the shelf. If a kid needs only 200 milligrams and it's a 500, so cut it in half and take off a little piece, grind it up, put it in some peanut butter, and you got Tylenol for a kid. It's, it doesn't take a genius. I'm, I, maybe I should have gone to medical school. But the, the rabbis here were afraid that if someone was sick and they come to do a Torah violation. So before we were talking about a rabbinic violation, that you know a Torah violation could be something more serious. So do we need a, lo a, a, a loss of function to be able to do that? So there's a couple of different opinions in the Shulchan Aruch. There's a first opinion by Rambam, and there's a second opinion in the Shulchan Aruch by the Ran, and there's all kinds of different opinions. But the bottom line is, without going through all the opinions, because it takes a long time, is that we do it with a Shinui. That's when a Shinui comes in. Remember, we talked about doing something in a different manner. You're going to grind the pill. You got to do it yourself for Shabbat. It's not life-threatening, but I'm going to grind the pill anyway. So maybe use your left hand and hold the mortar and pestle and grind the pill. You've done something a little bit different to show respect for Shabbat Kodesh by doing something a little bit different. So if you're going to normally use the muscles of the back of your hand, because your habit is to flip on the light like this, maybe you'll do it like this with your thumb. Do something different. You're using a different muscle group in your body to do a shinui to do something different to perform the task in an irregular way. And that's where that whole idea of a shinui on Shabbat came uh, forward because you're using different muscles to perform the, the task that you would use in performing it the regular way. You know, um, so th 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 then there's a, um, an opinion on this topic by somebody known as the Egle Tal. So the Egle Tal is Rav Bornstein, and Rav Bornstein was also known as the Avne Nezer. That's the term that I learned when I was studying. And, uh, you know, he, uh, the Avne Nezer is another great book, and Rambam explains the Avne Nezer like this. Anyone who is following the third opinion of the Rambam of doing something in a Shinui, you can do things that are even prohibited by the Torah. Wow. Big, sen big sentence by Rambam. Rambam saying here, you can do things and actually violate the Torah. For instance, for those that, uh, he didn't say this, this is a sidebar. He said, for instance, for those that may have some incandescent light bulbs still around the house, switching on those bulbs is considered a Torah violation because Rambam said the prohibition to cooking on Shabbat is not limited to cooking food. But the Gemara makes a reference to boiling dyes in pots to dye wool. You see where I'm going with this? We talked about the, the light bulbs and the idea of cooking that maybe you're not uh, cooking food. You're not boiling potatoes. You're boiling water with dye to make a color. Remember we said sovea, tzva, because dyeing is one of the malachas and you're going to dye the... You know where I saw that for the first time in my life? 
I had to buy buttons one time for a whole chorus, a hundred men. And we were going to sing in a competition. They were making vests. And I was in charge of getting the fabric and the buttons and the this and that. So the ladies would all sew this for us and we'd have these outfits. Okay. So I went down to a company on Spadina and Adelaide and in the basement. The guy had a business, a Jewish man named, it was called National Buttons. And I went to him and I said, I need some buttons. And he said, how many buttons? I said, I don't know. I got six buttons for 100 men. He says, you need six buttons for each thing and a little bit extra. You need a thousand buttons. I said, I need a thousand buttons. What kind of button? A knurled edge, a straight edge, a flat edge, a shiny one, a matte finish. He had all these. I never knew there's so much about buttons. I said, we'll take a flat finish. You want a four hole or a two hole? They had four hole buttons. They had two hole buttons. By the time we got through this and went through it, he says, what color? I don't remember what color it was. Let's say it was blue, black. I want black. No, black wouldn't give me. And then I can't tell the joke, the story. I wanted blue, Noreen. I, I, I wanted blue buttons. Okay, blue. Come with me. He took me into a room that looked like a kitchen. He had 10 pots on two stoves or three stoves, boiling water. And he started to mix colors in pots on these old stoves, these gas stoves. And he's boiling dye in pots to show me what kind of blue he could do for the buttons. And there was a light blue. There was a dark blue. There was a medium blue. And he was boiling it. Now the business became, went out because nobody's going to take it over when he went because everything comes already colored from China. But back then, National Buttons was boiling. And that's the first time I ever saw boiling dye. And it never hit me until I was studying halacha that the 39 malachas referred to boiling dyes on Shabbat, not boiling pots of food. No one is going to dye the wool in order to do this. You have to boil them, and that's cooking. Uh, one of the uh, teachers said, Bishol, therefore, the Rambam said, using heat to soften or to harden something is a prohibition of Bishol and a Torah violation. So if you heat metal, like a blacksmith who has to heat it up to so it's glowing, it's very, very hot. And you're doing this, why? Because you want to shape it. To shape metal, you got to make it very hot. And then you hammer it into the shape that you want. Therefore, he says, switching on an old incandescent light bulb is a Torah violation. But nowadays with LED bulbs, we have no glowing filament. And therefore, it's not a Torah prohibition. It's what? It's a rabbinic violation. So if you flip on a non-incandescent light bulb on Shabbat, and it's only a rabbinic violation, and it's no longer a Torah violation because it's no longer related to cooking, that lessens the severity of the violation. That's changing. Blowing out a candle on Shabbat is a rabbinic prohibition because for it to be considered a Torah violation, you have to do something constructive. Lighting a candle is creating something new. Blowing out a candle is not creating something new. It's like the sheet of paper that you tear in half. Are you creating something new or are you just destroying something? If you blow out the candle, it's a rabbinic prohibition. You're not supposed to blow it on a Shabbos, but it's not a Torah violation extinguishing a candle it's a rabbinic violation but lighting a fire to light the candle on shabbat is a torah violation that's creating something new burning wood to make charcoal is constructive you are making charcoal you're burning the wood you're charring it so that you can make charcoal that's your purpose so even though you're destroying the wood to make the charcoal you're still constructing something that's a usable item right it's usable 
So that, if you're making charcoal, is considered a Torah violation on Shabbat. Blowing out a candle is simply extinguishing. That's all it is. It's blowing out a candle. It's not creating anything new. And blowing out a candle is still a rabbinic violation. But you have to figure out how to do it with a shinui. You got to blow out a candle on Shabbat. I don't know. Uh, walk by very quickly. Your intention is to go open the front door and maybe it goes out. Open the window. I'm not blowing it out. I only opened the window. The fact that there's a breeze coming through the window and the breeze blew out the candle, it's not my fault. You know what I mean? You get the idea. So um, here's an idea from the Vilna Gaon. He says this, some people will permit a Jew to do anything for the sick person on Shabbos, as long as it's only a rabbinic violation. But most of our authorities, most poskim, don't embrace this approach. Most poskim say that whether it's a rabbinic prohibition or whether it's a Torah prohibition, you have to do it with a shinui. You should still do it in an irregular way. And the Gaon, the Vilna Gaon says this, and I'm quoting him. And I add my name to the long list of Rabbanim who embrace this opinion. If for some reason you cannot do what you have to do in a regular way, and there's no non-Jew available, and you find yourself stuck in a situation where you can't find a way to do it in an irregular way, mutar la'asot kedarko. Just do it in the regular, ordinary way. Just do it. And that's what seems to be correct. It's a very unique opinion by a very great rabbi, which is even more lenient than the other rabbis. The Vilna Gaon is saying, there's no non-Jew around. I'm here by myself. Um, I can't do it in the irregular way. I can't, I'm not going to light the stove and blow up the house. Okay, I got to cook something for someone who's sick on Shabbat uh, or even for myself. Uh, with the thing and do it backwards in an irregular way. I'm just going to do it the regular way. He said, just do it. Do it. Mutar means permitted. La sot to do. Kedarko in the regular way. It's different than all of the poskim that we've learned so far. The Vilna Gaon. Very much ahead of his time. And then he says, um, that it's not embraced by everyone and it's lenient. And there are other opinions which we also look at to respect. The Mishnah Brura is a volume, a set of books by the Chafetz Chaim. The Mishnah Brura gives rabbinic opinions based on the Shulchan Aruch. Are there lenient opinions? Are there strict opinions? And which opinions might we follow? So what you're not supposed to do is say, I'll give you an example. Uh, you don't normally do tashlich on Shabbat if it's Rosh Hashanah and it falls on Shabbat in the first day. You wait to the second day. Right? And because um, normally you're supposed to run the first day to do tashlich. You have up until Hoshana Rabbah to do tashlich. There's a leniency. But if you can do it earlier, you should do it. But it falls on Shabbat. There was one rabbi who wrote in the Mishnah Bura, he feels that you should rush to do the mitzvah. Even if it's Shabbat, you should walk to a stream and do tashlich. It's not held by any other rabbis. Nobody else follows it. So could we say, you know what? I'm going to follow the one rabbi who went against the other 92. No, you're not supposed to look for that one opinion because you might find a rabbi who says, you know, eating shrimp isn't so bad. You can't do that. You got to follow what the majority of rabbanim are following. So can we follow one lenient opinion by the Vilna Gaon? So the Mishnah Brura and most poskim reject this over lenient opinion. See, I got excited when I heard this by the Vilna Gaon. I said, you know what? It's not even a bad story. Everybody just do it. Just do it in the regular way. And I said, to me, honestly, be'inenu, between all of us, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. It's common sense to do what the Vilna Gaon is saying. But we are not one person. If we have a vote and there's 15 of us here in the Zoom room, 
and you all vote and I have a different opinion, you're not going to follow Marshall's opinion. You're going to follow the opinion of most. And this opinion of most is that it's rejected. And the Mr. Bura, although rejecting the opinion of the uh, Vilna Gaon, he does mention the opinion. Well, if it's being rejected completely, or even partly, why is the Mishnah Brura still saying it? Why is the Mishnah Brura saying, you know, there's an opinion that one Rav said that you can do Tashlich on Shabbat. Perhaps they're mentioning the opinion because they're saying, if by mistake you didn't know, and you did the uh, Tashlich on Shabbat on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, that wasn't your kavanah to break Shabbos, your kavanah was to do tashlich, then perhaps we should be lenient. So the Mishnah Bura doesn't embrace the idea of the Vilna Gaon, but, he, the, but the Mishnah Bura is mentioning it, so it's weighty enough, it's important enough to mention. And that's important. So even that opinion of doing tashlich on Shabbat could be an important opinion, because if it's already done, if somebody did it, if somebody didn't know, a rabbi in your shul in, I don't know where, Dayton, Ohio, says this is what we're going to do, and that's your congregational rabbi, you might not look it up. You just say the rabbi said it's okay, I'm going to do it. Afterwards, you find out we're not supposed to do that. You didn't violate anything on a Torah level. You know what I mean? There's different levels. So if you see someone doing something for the benefit of a sick person in a regular, ordinary way, not with a shinui, in a regular, ordinary way, there is no reason to correct this person. There is no reason to go up to them and say, you know, you really should use the back of the hand when you turn the light on. The person doesn't care what you say about what they should do when they're looking after someone who's sick on Shabbat. And why do we say this, that you should not correct this person and not educate them? We say it because there still is an opinion by the Vilna Gaon, a weighty posek like this, even though it's an obscure opinion, and even though it's not heavily relied on by all the other poskim, think about who said it. And if it's mentioned in the Mishnah Brura, and you see somebody doing it, you should not correct them and tell them they shouldn't have done it because they still have whom to rely upon. It's very important because you have a rabbi in a community, in a congregation, and I've said this before, there are rabbis and then there are rabbis. Not everybody's a posek. Some rabbis get a smicha because they studied nida, halacha, technology, uh, um, kashrut, uh, basar, b'chalav. They know the law is to tell you not to break Shabbos of the 39 malachas. They know enough to tell you that uh, if a piece of flashix that absorbed milk fell into your chillant and you can see it, you can pull it out. And if you have 60 times the amount of food, you can still eat it. But if it mixes in, and it's hot, maybe you should not eat it. We get those concepts. We understand it. But if a rabbi in a shul gives a congregation an opinion, we shouldn't correct that person by telling them, you were wrong. The majority follow this because the rabbi who made that decision, and maybe it was an honest, we'll call it, um, non-guided decision is doing it because they felt it was the right thing to do at that particular time. They still perhaps might have an opinion to rely on. The rabbi that took their congregation out on Shabbat to do tashlich, which is not the followed opinion, does have whom to rely upon. And here we have the Vilna Gaon, the most lenient of all in this opinion, to rely upon. So if you ask, if somebody asks you and says, um, you know, do you have a relationship with them? Can you give them an opinion of the Rambam? Can you give them the third opinion? Can you 
explain to him that maybe we should follow this opinion. Yes, you have a good friend and the friend says to the other friend who's the colleague, you know, the community, that's a big word, the community, because Brenda brought up an issue. No, Marion did. Marion brought it up. Why do the kids ride their, their play sports on Shabbat in the, in, the, in the yeshiva, no less, in the courtyard on Shabbos? Well, I'd rather have them doing that than playing video games. So I look at it as um, they have whom to rely upon. And that's what their community does. So the answer, Marianne, is our community does and doesn't do certain things. And we are supposed to follow our community. In my community here, my little 10, 20 blocks of my area, the Orthodox Jews here in the Ashkenazi world do not ride their bicycles on Shabbat. Personally, don't give me the excuse my bicycle might break on Shabbos. I don't buy it. And I might come to fix it. The reason they don't want you riding your bicycle on Shabbat is because it's called traveling. You might travel outside the A-roof. That's what it was. The A-roofs were smaller back then. They got bigger and bigger and bigger. You might drive outside the A-roof by accident. If my community here rode bicycles on Shabbat, I can tell you right now, I would ride my bicycle on Shabbat happily to shul, back from shul, to wherever, go to Earl Bales Park. I don't see a problem with riding a bicycle on Shabbat, even though I may be exerting myself. I'll shower after Shabbat. I think that it's important to follow what your community does. And my community here doesn't ride it, so I don't ride it. So Rav Yosef Karo, who's Rav Yosef Karo? Who, who is Rav Karo? Somebody please tell me and we'll wrap this up for today. Come on, Rav Yosef Karo. He is the author of the Shulchan Aruch that we follow. The author of the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, don't forget, he's known as the Mechaber and the author of the Shulchan Aruch. He wrote many books. He wrote the Beit Yosef. He wrote the, uh, the Kesef Mishnah. He says that in his opinion, and this is his opinion before he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, which by the way, the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isserlis was writing a similar book at the same time. We talk about that. He commented on this Rambam before he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. And he said, forbidden, asur, can't do it. There are two kinds of rabbinic prohibitions on Shabbos. Some are fences around the Torah to perfect Torah, pr protect Torah prohibitions. And others are independent of the 39 malachas. And therefore, they are purely rabbinic. But they're still rabbinic. So he had a whole different approach to it. Um, the, there, there's tons and tons more to learn on the subject because the, 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 the one opinion I'm going to bring up next time with us is the very, 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 very strict opinion of the Shmirat Shabbat Kihil Chata. Um, I'll uh, take that on up with you next week and uh, then we'll finally get uh, to alternative medicine, which I wanted to get to today. But uh, there's just too much talking. I talk too much. The Shmirat Shabbat Kilchata, the author of the Shmirat Shabbat Kilchata, wrote a volume of a one volume book, which later on became two volumes, posthumously put out by his family after he died. His family found more of his works. They put it out in two books. And some of the second volume contradicts some of his opinions in the first volume. But we'll talk about that and which ways we follow it. And what if you never bought the second book? What if you only bought the first book? Can you follow only the first book? It's an interesting concept. All right, so have a good day, everyone. I'll let you go. And um, we'll uh, gather again next week, hopefully in Yerts Hashem. Thank, Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. everybody. Bye. I, just want, I just want to mention, have you been to the Karo Shul in uh, Svat, yes. uh, Marshall? Yeah. Of course. Isn't it gorgeous? Very gorgeous. There's always people outside asking for money. Yeah, I know. I remember you ever that. Never noticed that. Yes. And there, but there's beautiful artwork all around. Oh, exquisite. Unaffordable by me, but beautiful. Yeah, still very exquisite. Anyway, yes, thank you, Marshall. Be yeah, well. Have a great well. day. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.